Good evening and uh, welcome to our service. Can I extend a very warm welcome to you on behalf of Dingwall and Strathpeffer Free Church and Ferentosh and Rizolis Free Church as we worship together as neighbouring congregations in gospel fellowship. Thank you once again for joining us. We are delighted that you are, that you are in fellowship with us too. So tonight uh, we're uh, going to revisit Romans 6, uh, 23. We were there in the morning as uh, we continue to explore life and death issues. Our call to worship, the words of Psalm 147, O oh, praise the Lord, how good it is to sing him songs of praise. So we respond to this call to worship as we praise the Lord in the words of Psalm 67. It's the Scottish Psalter version, Lord, bless and pity us, shine on us with thy face, that the earth, thy way, and nations all may know thy saving grace. To God's praise. Lord. Let's draw near to God in prayer as we unite our hearts in prayer one with another. Let's pray. Gracious God, we come into your presence in the name of our risen and exalted Saviour, the Lord Jesus, crowned with resurrection splendour. We praise you that Jesus abounded abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. We praise you that death has been swallowed up in victory. Jesus is the resurrection and the life, and because he lives and ever lives, we too shall live. Bless, we pray, our respective congregations, Dingwall and Strathpeffer, and Ferentosh and Rizolis. Bless our fellowship in the gospel, isolated and somewhat detached as it is over these days. Unite us and bind us together by God the Holy Spirit. Be near, we pray, to all who may feel afraid and anxious. We pray for the vulnerable and for those at risk. Shield them, we pray. Bless and sustain our frontline workers. We are liable to forget them as, uh, as uh, the coronavirus appears uh, to, to ease. But nonetheless, enable us to pray for all NHS staff, care workers and volunteers and helpers alike across our wider community. 
May we look above and beyond all that perplexes us to Jesus. He promises rest for the weary and the distressed. We remember all who are experiencing brokenness heightened by lockdown. We remember those living with loss, with no one to hold their hand or to physically embrace them. Those experiencing uncertainty, stress, and anxiety through loss of income, from crowded refugee camps in Bangladesh to shanty towns in Peru to our own nation with its pressing needs at this time. We pray for all who manage the phase lifting of lockdown. We ask, Lord God, that they would get the appropriate balance and formula. We pray for racial harmony in our land, across our nation and the nations of the world, that black families would be able to live free from fear, that the recognition of long-standing injustices would lead to real change for the oppressed. We pray for our leaders at Westminster and Holyrood. We pray that they would become more sensitive to the dangers of a godless society that turns its back on God's law. We pray that we might all discern that God's law is perfect and converts the soul in sin that lies. We seek mercy, we seek pardon, we seek forgiveness anew for all of our many sins. We confess our waywardness, our shortcomings, our inadequacies. We ask, Lord God, Father in heaven, that you would receive us graciously, and all we ask is in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Now, we're going to read the Word of God together, and uh, similar to this morning, we're going to read two passages of Scripture, one from the Old Testament, one from the New Testament. Our first reading is taken from Isaiah chapter 55, verses 1 to 3. This is the Word of God. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come by and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good, and you will delight in the richest of fare. Give ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. Our second reading is taken from Mark's Gospel, chapter 10, and at verse 17. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, Go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked round and said to his disciples how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of 
God. And so on. Amen. And we trust that God will add his blessing to the reading of his own holy and inspired word. Well, turn with me once again to Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We trust that God will indeed add his blessing to the reading of his own word from these passages we've read from the Old Testament and the New Testament. Well, here we are. We're back to Romans chapter 6, verse 23. And uh, we're looking again very much at the theology of life and death. Yes, life and death issues in Romans 6, verse 23. Two things I'd like us to consider together for a short time. A gift to be received or a goal to be achieved. We're focusing primarily on these words, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. If you've done the Christianity Explored course, then you will recall that when you reach episode 6, it's all about grace. But there's a probing question. And it goes like this. If God asked, why should I give you eternal life? What would you say? If God asked, why should I give you eternal life? What would your response be to that question? Maybe it would go something like this. I'm a good person. I don't steal. I don't lie. I go to church. I give blood. I'm not a murderer. I treat others like I like to be treated. I give to charity. I'm a spiritual person. I've been baptized. I go to church regularly and take communion. I read the Bible. In our reading in Mark chapter 10, Jesus profiles an affluent and self-assertive young man. He effectively wants to know how to be good enough for God. Notice what Jesus does. Jesus makes it crystal clear that you and I can never do enough to inherit eternal life. But you can hear the rich young man profiled in Mark 10 saying, but I've ticked all the boxes. I've earned eternal life, have I not? He asks for credit because he he thinks that he's worthy of credit. Now, in the world of finance, a credit score is based on an analysis of a person's credit files to determine the credit worthiness of that person. A credit score is primarily based on the credit report information typically sourced from credit bureaus. What is this young man saying to Jesus? He wishes to determine his credit worthiness. He asks for recognition as well. He wants to scoop some brownie points. You know, the, 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 the badges, the merit badges obtained by brownies for carrying out good deeds. That's his frame of mind. 
I've earned God's favor, he says to Jesus. I deserve his goodwill. I'm a good person. Now reward me accordingly. I've earned my plot, my place in heaven. I deserve it, do I not? How does Jesus respond? Well, Jesus' response could not be more uncompromising. Jesus says to him, sell all that you have, let it go, dissolve your bonds, sever your ties, and come to me and follow me. Jesus makes it abundantly clear to him that eternal life is not a reward for services rendered. And that is the point that Paul is making in Romans 6, 23. Salvation is a gift to be received. Eternal life is to be accepted by faith as a free gift paid for by the death of Jesus. This is grace, God's undeserved gift, God's unmerited favor imparted to us through Jesus Christ. Isn't the contrast in Romans 6.23 really quite compelling? So, at one end of the scale are the three words we were focusing on this morning, wages, sin, and death. And at the other end of the scale are the words that are our threefold threefold focal point this evening, gift, God, and eternal life. The question is this, at which end of the scale are you living your life at the moment? We've reached the the great climax of the book of Romans and chapter 6 in particular, we are reminded that this gift in verse 23 cannot be purchased, it cannot be earned, it cannot be merited. God gives it freely via Calvary's cross. So, what is the theology of grace by definition? Well, let me put it like this. As the hymn writer puts it, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I cling. What are you clinging to over these days? Secondly, a goal to be achieved. So, we are effectively asking the question, a gift to be received or a goal to be achieved? Well, we've answered that question, but let's explore it further as Romans 6, 23 encourages us to. The 19th century prince of preachers, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, once imagined himself standing in life's marketplace as a gospel trader. And he went on to say, the difficulty with other traders is to get you up to their price. But the difficulty he experiences, as he puts it, is to get you down to mine, for the bread of heaven is without price. The gift of Romans 6.23, to reinforce the point we made earlier, it cannot be purchased by the recipient. It's received, not achieved. It's not something that can be paid back. Perhaps you see it otherwise. Maybe you've struggled with this, with this formula of a gift to be received, a goal to be achieved. How do I reconcile the two? Maybe you've been chipping away quietly, perplexed by thoughts such as, I'm not good enough. I need to earn God's favor more and more. Is this your goal in life? Well, let me tell you about Diane. Diane was an office worker based in the city of London. 
during the boom and bust Britain of the 1990s. It was a time of rapidly increasing stock prices. Market confidence for, for companies was high, and she worked her socks off. She developed a 24-7 approach to work. She was aiming high. She would do anything to reach the very top of her career ladder. Nothing would stop Diane from doing so. She wished to prove herself to senior management. The more she pushed herself to earn their recognition, their credit, and their favor, the higher they pushed the bar of expectation and performance. The more she worked towards their higher expectations, the higher the bar went again, until one day, weary, exhausted, spent, Diane collapsed, fatigued, burnt out. She bowed out. And in the boom years, she was the one who was bust and broken. The question I want to ask is whether there might be something of Diane in you. You see, God, as, as a worker, might see a boss if I please him, if I impress him, if I earn his favor by active doing, by being more engaging, by being a law-abiding citizen, subscribing to the Ten Commandments religiously, by achieving, by attaining, by accomplishing, by doing, then I'll get to that next level of acceptance and recognition and elevation in the sight of God. But perhaps just like Diane, you're more than a little spent trying to do so, trying to win God over. You've labored over many years, and your self-righteousness strategy continues to be a painful, laborious work in progress. Your spiritual journey to moral attainment and righteousness has been a long, long journey, perhaps, and it's exhausting. Maybe you're just like the child in, a back, in the back of a, of a car asking her parents wearily, are we nearly there yet? You're tired, you're weary, you're burdened, you're, you're heavy laden. Well, if that describes you, hear the words of Jesus. He says, come to me and I will give you rest. I have the words of eternal life. I gift you the gift of divine grace. And you don't need to achieve it. You simply receive it. There was once a ship in distress of the Canadian coast, with its fresh water supply completely exhausted. There was a state of emergency on the deck of that ship. The captain, in desperation, sent out an SOS for fresh water, and the reply came back immediately. Let your buckets down. You see, they had sailed beyond the estuary into the fresh waters of the river St. Lawrence. You know, you too may be thirsting for life-giving waters. The gospel responds in a similar vein to your SOS. The gospel says to you too, let your buckets down. Drink freely from the grace-filled 
waters of salvation in Jesus Christ. Have your fill. Let your soul delight itself in the abundance of the free gift of God, eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, summed up so passionately and fervently by the prophet Isaiah in our reading in chapter 5, chapter 55 of his prophecy. Come, all of you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat, because this gift, it is without money, it is without price. Listen, the prophet says, that you may live. What are the fundamentals of Romans 6.23 as we close? Well, surely this. We are saved by grace through faith. And this is not your own doing or, or, or my doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Ephesians chapter 2. You see, you and I cannot under any circumstances earn, win, or merit God's favor. We don't deserve it. Yet the wonder of grace is that the God of all grace is merciful. Our sins, they are many, but His mercy is more. He saves us because of His mercy, not because of anything remotely righteous that we might achieve or earn as we try to win over His favor. This is the free gift of God. And it's spelt out for us in a word in Romans 6, 23. It's the everlasting covenant of which Isaiah speaks of in chapter 55. And it's imparted to us in Christ Jesus. And all that's asked of you right now is to simply receive it. Amen. Let's bring our service to a close as we sing the words, Come, O fount of every blessing. Come, O fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing your grace, streams of mercy, never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. The Ray family will lead us in this, our closing item of praise to God's praise.
May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit remain with us all. Amen.